Are we being lied to about the world? The universe itself is some kind of conscious mind. What does it all mean? You know, maybe we're in a computer simulation and our designer is just some random software engineer in the next universe up. Or maybe, maybe there's a designer a little bit more like the traditional god, but maybe not all powerful. Maybe, you know, just made the best universe they can. And it's like, no, no, it's gonna be messy, but this is the best I could do. It's this or nothing. My favorite hypothesis though. Are we talking about a simulation? That is one hypothesis I consider. So I, I consider a range of hypotheses without, I'm trying to sort of kick off a discussion here. I consider a range of hypotheses without settling for sure on one of them. Um, I don't like the God hypothesis for the f familiar reason that the difficulty reconciling a loving or powerful God with the terrible suffering we find in the universe. And so I have a chapter on that. Um, but there, there are a number of possibilities for making sense of cosmic purpose without God. Uh, perhaps the most straightforward is just to have some kind of designer, but different to the traditional God. And one possibility, as you say, Andrew, is the simulation hypothesis. Um, you know, maybe we're in a computer simulation and our designer is just some random software engineer in the next universe up. Or maybe, maybe there's a designer a little bit more like the traditional God, but maybe not all powerful. Maybe, you know, just made the best universe they can. And it's like, no, no, it's gonna be messy, but this is the best I could do. It's this or nothing. Um, or maybe maybe a bad designer. So I consider a range of sort of non-standard designer hypotheses. But it's, it's not obvious that we need some kind of conscious mind to underpin cosmic purpose. You know, perhaps the directedness towards life is just some kind of fundamental tendency of the universe that doesn't have a deeper explanation. That's something I take seriously. My favorite hypothesis though, and this connects with my work on consciousness more generally, is cosmopsychism, that the universe is itself a conscious mind with its own goals. And this feels really weird, even more weird than cosmic purpose, but I try to say that's actually not as extravagant a hypothesis as you might at first think. Is that the same as panpsychism? <clears throat> I would say it's a form of panpsychism. So panpsychism, is the view that consciousness goes all the way down to the fundamental building blocks of reality. Um, it's standardly talked about in terms of sort of conscious particles. So maybe electrons and quarks have some incredibly simple forms of experience. And then the very complex experience of the human or animal brain is somehow built up from these simpler forms of particle consciousness. However, Many theoretical physicists are more inclined to think actually our universe is, is not made up of little billiard ball particles, but is made up of universe wide fields. And particles are just sort of local excitations in those fields. And if you combine that with panpsychism, then you get the view that the fundamental forms of consciousness underlie these universe wide fields. And then you come very close to thinking the universe itself is some kind of conscious mind. So I try, I mean, I think this is panpsychism more generally and this form of panpsychism is, is for independent reasons, a very, a very attractive philosophical account of consciousness for reasons we could perhaps go into. So I think there's independent motivation, but also it can perhaps provide a quite simple parsimonious explanation of the fine tuning, right? Why, why post, if you already believe in a conscious universe, why postulate a supernatural designer outside of the universe? If you can just think, well, maybe the universe just fine tuned itself. My God, but not God. Well, okay. I'm going to get back onto that in a second about the universe being conscious itself. While on the simulation theory, why does Elon Musk, for example, I mean, I know he's not a scientist, but he's probably the most famous person to push simulation theory. Why does he say it's like 99.99% sure that we are part of a simulation? Well, I'm not totally sure of his, his motivations in particular. 
But there, there are some interesting arguments the philosopher Nick Bostrom came up with and the philosopher David Chalmers had a, had a book recently exploring these issues. And very roughly, the idea is, well, look, you know, we, we seem to have a lot of interest in creating simulations. And if we live for tens of thousands more years, Hopefully, we'll get more and more computing power. We'll be able to build bigger and bigger simulations. At some point, you might think there's going to end up being more simulations <laughs> than there are actual physical universes. You know, maybe we'll get interested in con constructing very detailed simulations of entire universes, right down to the the particles and the fields and so on. And so if you're thinking in the fullness of time and you think, well, at some point in the future, there's more simulated universes than real universes, then you might start to think, well, what are the odds that I'm lucky enough to be in one of the physical ones rather than the simulated ones? So I think, you know, it's, I, I think it's a very interesting argument to think about. My, I mean, my issue, I suppose, is with the starting point. I, I don't think creatures in a simulation would be conscious. So, right. so, so Bostrom's assumption is that Consciousness is just sort of about structure, information processing. And therefore, if I had a very detailed, exact simulation of your brain with all the structure and complexity, then the simulation of your brain would be conscious in the same way you are. I don't buy that view of consciousness. I think consciousness is more the stuff of the universe rather than to do with abstract organization and structure. So I, I, I reject the starting point, although I've got a, a big discussion of it in the book. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a cool thing to think it about. It makes sense to me, though, again, as a complete beginner here in this world, that if you just replicated every bit of the brain yeah. in a simulation, uh, what, what is missing for it to experience consciousness, consciousness in the way that we do? Yeah, we're getting back to, well, we're getting down to big questions here <laughs> about where consciousness comes from and to answer that question, we need to come head to head with what philosophers have traditionally called the mind-body problem. This challenge of explaining how consciousness and the physical world fit together. And there are a variety of possibilities, right? Maybe the physical world is fundamental hmm. and consciousness kind of pops out of that. This is the physicalist view. My own preferred view is it goes the other way around. It's no, it's consciousness that's fundamental, and the physical the physical world emerges from underlying facts about consciousness. That's the panpsychist view. A third option, which is probably the traditional one in most societies in history, dualism that both the physical world and consciousness are fundamental but radically different. Maybe consciousness is in the soul or something. Um, now. Crucially, what I'm always most passionate about emphasizing is that this is not a scientific problem. This is not something you can answer with an experiment, right? For any empirical scientific data, each of these theories will just interpret that data on their own terms. So this is not, people think physicalism is the scientific option. I think that's just false, right? The scientific data is just neutral on all these options. We just have to take them on their own terms and try and evaluate them in terms of what they're trying to explain, how well they do it, what they're trying to explain, how simple they are, and try and work out the, the, the best option. I think when we do that, panpsychism looks to be a much more plausible theory than, than the physicalist, more mainstream view. And so that's why I think we should head in that direction. So simulation theory sounds reasonable, except that you posit that that somebody in a simulation probably wouldn't have consciousness in the way that we do. Uh, cosmopsychism, is that where you lean towards that the universe itself is some sort of animal that is conscious of itself? Yeah, that's animal. Is an animal a word? That's interesting, a sort of organism. I mean, clearly the, the, the universe did not evolve. Our minds and our consciousness are the result of millions of years of evolution. And so I think... If the universe is conscious, it's going to be a very different kind of mind or consciousness to an evolved organic mind. Um, and, you know, this is panpsychism is in a sense very Copernican. 
I've had some discussions with the novelist Philip Pullman, and he put me onto this idea that just as Copernicus made us see, you know, we're not the center of the universe, we're just one planet going around one star among trillions. So for the panpsychist, consciousness of a human being isn't the paradigm on which we base everything. Our consciousness is just one highly evolved form of what exists throughout the universe. So if the universe is conscious, it has a very different kind of consciousness to us. But perhaps we can start then to make sense of some kind of goal directedness um, arising from the, the the conscious goals of the universe. And I like that. I think I like that best because just taking cosmic purpose as just a brute fact is kind of a bit unsatisfying. You know, you want some explanatory depth. Then if you go for these designer hypotheses, putting something outside of the universe, okay, maybe you get a, a deeper explanation, but then that's a bit unparsimonious, like postulating some supernatural entity. The nice thing about cosmopsychism is you, you get the explanatory depth. We've got an explanation of cosmic purpose in terms of the consciousness of the universe, but you don't have to postulate anything supernatural. Um, and so, you know, I think it's that nice balance of explanation and simplicity. I can't get away from an image of like, again, the, the universe is this big animal and we're like a mm. bit of bacteria on its leg. Um, and we can't possibly ever think in such a complex manner. We'll never be able to understand the thought processes of this big universe animal. I'm sure that's way off, but that's how my head, maybe in a, even in a Philip Pullman kind of imagery way is imagining it. It might not be too bad a way to think about it, depending on on, on how you think. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, Alfred North Whitehead, who was a late 19th century, early 20th century mathematician and philosopher who had a kind of panpsychist view. And he advocated that the Newtonian metaphor of the universe as a clock or a machine, a clockwork machine is sort of outdated. And it would be better to think of the universe as a kind of organism, as a kind of evolving organic process. Um, maybe that's right, but all of these things are, you know, images, metaphors, and which have some usefulness, but maybe shouldn't be taken too seriously. Well, what is the usefulness in, in, in your work? And I, I don't mean that work should be valued by its use or usefulness or practicality, because of course we need thinkers and philosophy, but are there, what, what have you touched on where you think, okay, this is how we need to think differently about, about the world and, and ourselves? Good. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like you, I am always keen to emphasize that we shouldn't just judge things by their practical use. And you know, you never know where the spin-offs come. I mean, some examples I like to give, um, the Reverend Thomas Bayes was obsessed with trying to respond to David Hume's arguments against miracles. And he came up with a little bit of mathematics we now call Bayes' theorem, which is just so important in, you know, computer science and tracking the COVID pandemic and um, um, in, in certain paradigms in neuroscience, predictive processing as well. Um, also, well, I mentioned Whitehead a moment ago, Whitehead and Bertrand Russell were thinking about how can we explain mathematics in terms of logic? Very useless, abstract, abstract uh, enterprise, but they produced uh, what we now call predicate logic, which, um, you know, underlies so much of modern uh, logic and, and computer science. You know, and also things can have value, even if it's not about building bridges and, you know, curing disease. I think it's a deep and noble instinct of human beings to try and find out the ultimate nature of reality. We'll never know for certain, but tr try to have our best guess. And I, I, you know, that's what fundamentally drives me. I just, I want to know the truth. I want to know what's really out there. Um, but yeah, I, I think in my, in my previous book, Galileo's Error, explored some of the possible practical implications of panpsychism. I think it has the potential to transform our relationship with the environment, for example. You know, if you just, if you just think of a tree as a, me as a mechanism, then its value is just 
what it does for us, basically, you know, in looking pretty or sustaining our existence. But if you think a tree is a conscious entity, albeit of a very alien kind, then it is a locus of moral importance in its own right. You know, chopping down a tree is an act of moral significance. If you see, you know, these terrible forest fires we saw in Brazil a few years back, if you think of that as the burning of conscious organisms, then, you know, there's a whole extra moral dimension there. So yeah, I, th I think there are possible practical implications. Fun you know, fundamentally, we should be thinking not about the view we'd like to be true, but of the view that's most likely to be true. Hmm. But, and I do think there's, you know, there's a good case for the probable truth of panpsychism, but I also happen to think it's probably a picture of reality that's also, luckily, happens to be a little bit better for our mental and spiritual health. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you wish to believe or by what you think would have beneficial social effects if it were believed, but look only and solely at what are the facts. That's my favourite ever uh, quote. You know, who it, you know who it was? Is that... Um... I'm not, I'm not Clifford, trying to, Clifford. You know, it was Bertrand Russell. Wasn't trying, oh, it was Russell. I'm not trying to catch you out by focus of the thumbs up as you would be able to. And I always love when I can be like, I know who that was. And I thought you were doing that. <laughs> oh, I should have known that, shouldn't I? Well, I'm I only said it because you mentioned Bertrand Russell before. And I thought, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to read that quote out. Um, but I love that. And I think it applies to pretty much everything that we speak on, uh, speak about on, on, on heretics yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So. Absolutely. Although having said that, you know, <laughs> I think there is perhaps room, some... I think there is room to an extent to hope beyond the evidence. I talk about a little bit about this towards the end of the book. Um, you know, for example, if, you, you know, if you've got a loved one who's very seriously ill, maybe there's a 30% chance they're going to make it. It could be reasonable to say, look, I have faith. You're going to make it. You know, I, I, I believe I'm going to, I'm going to live in, I'm going to root for you to make it. Mm. You know, maybe if they've got like, 1% chance of making it, then that would be irrational. You should help them reconcile to, to the inevitable. But I think to a limited extent, it can be rational to sort of hope beyond the evidence. And this, you know, I talk about this a little bit towards the end of the book, because although I think there's evidence for some kind of cosmic purpose, I don't think we know what the hell that... I don't think we know much more specifically about were that cosmic purpose is directed towards, you know, I mean, it could be that this is the end. It was just about the emergence of life. Um, it could be there is some greater form of existence to come as unfathomable to us as our existence is to worms. And, you know, I think to an extent it can be reasonable to hope, not to believe, but to hope that there is some, you know, greater reality to come and that we can if that can help us find motivation in trying to make the world a better place in the hope of some greater world to come, then, you know, I think that can be legitimate. I, I really like the work of um, William James, who talked about this in his wonderful paper, The Will to Believe. Hmm. Many, many, that's from the, the sort of turn of the century, William James. Mm. Was that, was that um, Henry, James, Henry James? It was Brother. indeed. It was indeed. Yeah. He's a great psychologist, philosopher, That's a right. wonderfully interesting thinker. He later said he thought that paper should have been called the right to believe rather than the will to believe because he was talking about in certain limited cases. And he very much would have disagreed with that um, Bertrand Russell line that we should always only ever go with the evidence. He thought, you know, evidence is important, but you only live once. Mm. There's a great deal of uncertainty. To an extent, it can be rational to hope beyond the evidence. He gives a vivid example of, um, suppose you're an explorer, you're lost on a mountain, and to survive, you've got to jump over this chasm. And it's very unclear whether you're going to make it. Would it be rational against the evidence, you might think, to believe you're going to make it? And he thinks, yeah, of course, you know, that, that might help you, you know, might help you actually, actually get over. And he saw that as a, as a metaphor for some kind of spiritual convictions that even in the absence of compelling evidence, it can be rational to hope. I'm hoping that I like the simulation thing a little bit, but not that simulation, but I sort of hope that when I die, I'll sort of wake up and it was a game and I get to go again or like do another game. And there's been a Rick and Morty where that, that happened yeah, as well, because yeah. I want to live forever. Um, hmm. I know a lot of people don't seem to want to, or they don't admit that they want to, to themselves, maybe. But is there a way I can live forever? 
oh, what? I, I, it's not a product I'm selling, but yeah, I, I didn't talk about the afterlife in the book. And I was just thinking more recently, there are maybe interesting things to think about in connection to cosmic purpose. I think I think I take three possibilities seriously about the afterlife. Mm. Uh, one it's something I talk about in, in my previous book, Galileo's Error, in the more experimental final chapter. Some kind of impersonal survival. So mystics in the Advaita Vedanta tradition and many, many mystical traditions talk of a, a core part of the mind which is universal and timeless. So this is what people are getting at when they say, you know, we're all one. Yeah. So the idea is it's not that like, I've got a soul and you've got a soul and they're different. There's something in me at the core of my being, which is the same thing that's at the core of your being and everyone else's. So no, on this- well, That's rubbish though, because I'm not, not what you're saying, but it's rubbish for me because I don't get to experience Yeah, it. yeah, some people- so, so I'm turning down your first one. There's an interesting conflict. <laughs> some people find that very satisfying and some people find it very- unsatisfying. I think I'm more on your side actually. Yeah. So, okay, what about more- I'm hopeful, you've got two more to- Okay, number two you know, the more regular idea of some kind of individual survival after death. Um, I think I, I would give, attach some kind of non-negligible probability to that. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that my view is a sort of middle way between traditional atheism and traditional theism, right? So, so if you're a traditional theist and you think there's just no meaning or purpose to the universe, I think you should have a very low probability of life after death. Right. Um, if you're on the on the other extreme, if you're a theist and you think there's a loving being who can do anything, you know, at the root of it, then then I think you know you should attach quite high probability, right? Because it's plausible a loving being would want to preserve our consciousness after death, you know, because it's a good thing to do. And if they can do anything, you know, then that's quite likely to happen. Whereas, so my view is a sort of middle way. I think there is this directedness towards the good, however we make sense of that, but it's one that is limited in its range and its abilities, as it were. So, it, I mean, it could be that this, the cosmic, the cosmic purpose that fine-tuned the universe is somehow able to preserve our consciousness after death, but it could be that it can't, right? So it's, so I guess I would attach a sort of um, non-negligible probability, but definitely less than 50%. Third possibility I take very seriously is that there is nothing after death, which in some way obviously seems to be the more simple hypothesis. And really, I, you know, I, I, don't, I just take all of those possibilities seriously. If you, interestingly, if you split the probability space between those three options, you'll end up with a 66.66 recurring possibility of some kind of life after death. So yeah, yeah. it's not bad, bad odds. You don't, you're not, you don't care about the first one. The though. first one's, yeah, that's nothing. That's just <laughs> You need like, to let go of your ego, man. Go <laughs> no, on a 10 day meditation. My ego is everything for me. <laughs> that's just like, you know, your foot's going to be alive in another dimension. Like, I'm not bothered about that. I right. want to sort of be chatting and thinking and uh -huh. breathing. So now it's a 50%. But maybe um, there's no such thing as the self. So it doesn't matter. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah oh my god yeah i do wonder that with the self but i don't want to go down that line wait sure. um because that's not an sure. hour is it know, that's another hour i can't that... remember what i think about it either so oh well there you go <laughs> speaking of, of of well but you know in the realm of ego and self you were on some of the biggest podcasts in the world lex friedman joe rogan russell brand what were they what were they like i don't know these people most people don't what's an insight um you know, Joe Rogan was one of the first podcasts I did, and I didn't know, really know who he was, actually. <laughs> and I think, I, I kind of read it because I think I was sort of, um, hadn't talked much to a general audience and kind of hadn't worked out. I think I've got a lot better over the last four or five years in sort of simplifying things and um, it doesn't always work. But I think he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Oh. And, you know, if you're a scientist, so I'd preparing, right, I'd watched his interviews with scientists and he's always like, oh, wow, man, that's amazing. So I thought he'd be like that with me. But I think like if people don't understand science, they think it's their fault. But if people don't understand philosophy, they think it's bullshit. <laughs> you know? And it was like, so I didn't manage to persuade him that there was a problem with consciousness. I guess he was coming back to 
Well, you make changes in your brain. It changes your consciousness. What's the problem? That's, of course, right. And no one would deny that. But I still think there's a philosophical question of why? Why does brain activity go along with consciousness? How does electrochemical signaling create this inner world of colors and sounds and smells and tastes? And so that remains unanswered. But um, yeah, Lex Friedman was was a nice conversation. He'd um, done his homework and made lots of notes. And then it was just the two of us in an apartment. And actually, I don't think I've ever said this actually on, but um, he um, he went to the bathroom just before we started and I sneaked around the table and read his notes. And then I realized the camera, the camera was already rolling. So, so he must have, so he must have looked back and saw me. Oh, since, no. So that was, that was a bit embarrassing. Did you not right? tell him, by the way, I did have a little sneak because at that point you have to tell him because he's going to see. No, I, I, I just kept it quiet like a, an embarrassed Englishman, but um yeah, we had some good conversations and, um, you know, I've had some really good debates and discussions with people as well. Today, Sean Carroll, the physicist, we had a, a live campus debate recently and mm. um, there were gasps from the audience. Like I said, he wouldn't get a good grade in my course because he didn't understand the argument and people. <gasps> but uh, but it was, you know, it was very friendly. I think, you know, I've got huge respect for. Yeah. Russell for Brand. pretty philosophical. Russell Brand. I used to work with Russell Brand, actually. Um before he was famous and uh, when I was wow. teaching English as a foreign language. And um, yeah, I didn't really, I just, so I have these memories of, as a 19 year old introvert, this guy, Russell, who was quite intimidating. And and it was only many years when I was finished my PhD and was trying to get an acad academic job and went back to the school and people were talking about Russell Brown. I went, no, oh my God, it was that, that was that guy. But um was he teaching English as the foreign language? Yeah, or Tef yeah. TEFL was it? Yeah, yeah. It was something similar to TEFL. Um, what was his behaviour yeah. around women like? Is that too far? Have we gone I too far? I didn't know him that well. I, uh, I mean, he was an extrovert and uh, you know charismatic and so on. But um, I didn't hang around with him well enough to. Hmm. It was it was before his fame. So yeah, and his infame. He. Yeah. Um, are we being lied to about the world? Um, you know, in the in the 16th century, when we started getting evidence that we weren't in the center of the universe, people struggled to accept that because it didn't fit with the picture of reality they got used to. And these days we tend to mock our ancestors. They, oh, those stupid religious people. Why didn't they just follow the evidence? But I think every generation absorbs a worldview they can't see beyond. And I think very much something similar is going on at the moment that we're ignoring certain kinds of evidence because it doesn't fit with how we've got used to thinking about reality. And I think future historians looking back will think, oh, that's really weird that they just ignored that. Just like we look back at the 16th century and think, how did they just ignore that evidence? That's a fascinating thought. And it's something we obviously overlook. And I'm sure on both sides of political spectrum, and we're, we're constantly doing that. Where Where is a place that you imagine, I suppose you can only speculate, that they will look back and go, what What the hell were they doing? Well, there's two big things I, f I focus on. Consciousness has been you know, the main focus of my research. We could talk about that. I think a whole way of thinking about things is in conflict with the reality of consciousness in ways I could we could talk about. But the other, in a way more straightforward thing is the, what's called the fine tuning of physics for life. This surprising discovery of recent decades that for life to be possible, certain numbers in physics had to be like Goldilocks porridge, just right. Mm. And against seemingly incredible odds, we ended up, as it were, winning the cosmic lottery, getting the right numbers for life. I, I think just in our standard ways of thinking about evidence, that looks like strong evidence for some sort of goal-directedness towards life in the very early stage of the universe, what philosophers traditionally call teleology, from the Greek telos for purpose or directedness. Now, that's really weird. <laughs> that's not how we've become used to thinking about science. And I think because of that, I think people are just 
trying to ignore it, trying to, because it doesn't fit with how we've got used to thinking about things. But I think we need to, ultimately, we need to set aside both our religious biases. I think we're very, in the West, we're very well trained to be alert to, oh, is this my religious bias, my upbringing, or whatever, but also our secular biases that maybe are established ways of thinking about science, of doing philosophy, have certain biases. And I think that's kind of what's going on here. One of my favorite things in English language is adding like ES to the end and making like biases. Do you enjoy, do you find you enjoy I saying do, it? actually. Now you mention it, I've never sort of thought about it's that. It's quite enjoyable to say. It is lovely, isn't it? I just Would that work that in an American accent, I think? Biases. It suddenly sound a bit... I've got Garish. a lot of biases, <laughs> I, t- I do declare. Um, sorry, i uh, offended an entire half a nation now. So is what you're saying, just to, to, I know you've already said it in a very layperson way, but for, for an even layer layperson, is, is, is what you're saying, it's so unlikely that we're here because all the mathematical things of the universe had to be exactly the right numbers for the universe to be made and that blah, blah, blah. And now we're here that we haven't thought about the fact enough that that suggests there could be some sort of direction behind it rather than just a complete blah, 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 which is how we think of it. Yeah, I think fundamentally we face a a kind of dilemma, right? Either it's just incredible, more than astronomical fluke that these numbers turned out just right for life, or these numbers in our physics are as they are because they are the right numbers for life. In other words, that there is some sort of directedness towards life at the fundamental level. And I think there are various people obviously go for God. I don't like the God hypothesis either. I think there are other ways of making sense of this, what I call cosmic purpose, some kind of directedness. But yeah, I I think that's, I mean, so you often hear people say, especially on Twitter, uh, I don't, I don't mind improbability, you know, like it's sort of brave to embrace improbability. Um, You know, and I think that makes sense to an extent if something's a bit improbable, but not that improbable, then you can take it's just a fluke. You know, if someone phones you and you're thinking about them or talk in my book about Jesus in toast, you know, where you get the, you oh, yes. the like the burn mark that's uncannily like yeah. Jesus or I guess the image of Jesus in Western art or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just a fluke and it's a bit of fun. But when things pass a certain level of improbability, I think that no longer becomes an option. I mean, so just take a simple example. You know, suppose we've got bank robbers break in to a bank and uh, there's a 20 digit combination on the safe and they get it right first time in, you know, 10 seconds. And that was two hypotheses. First hypothesis, they just guessed and they, they just got it right. Second hypothesis, they had inside information and they knew that I obviously you're going to go for the second hypothesis because the first is just too improbable. And I, I, I think that's something like the situation we're facing with fine tuning, that it's just too improbable to take it to be fluke. And there are, you know, fairly simple hypotheses, I think, that can make sense of it not being a fluke. And... I think the reason we don't take them more seriously is it, cultural reasons. It just feels weird, just like it felt weird in the 16th century, you know, not to be in the center of the universe. Hypotheses is another one of those words it that is. I like. God, we're hit. See, hy- see, see how many we can hit today. Hypotheses of the biases. Okay, so so and obviously you've heard this before, but the the way my mind had already worked this out from the, the bits of TV I've watched about, uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Brian Cox and all that, is there's actually an infinite number of universes or whatever, and one of them had to have the right numbers. We're talking, I guess it's the numbers like this is what this this is what gravity is, and this is what this weighs, and that's what that is, or whatever. One had to be right, and if that's true, then that one was always going to have life on it, and that life had to be in the place where it worked. And does that yeah. make sense, what I've just said? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And well, Andrew, this is, you know, this is exactly what I thought for a long time. I, I've always thought the fine tuning needed explaining. I've never been on the team that thinks, you know, it just, it just, it's just brute fact or whatever. But I thought for a long time, the multiverse hypothesis looked to be the more plausible option. I mean, I don't like, I, I, you know, I wrestled with this for a long time. I don't like standing up in front of my peers defending cosmic purpose, you know, I feel silly. And, um, you know, I think that's how these sort of 
ideology works, doesn't it? You, you feel a bit silly if you kind of walk away from the established position. Um, and it was only actually five or six years ago when I started teaching this stuff that I discovered there's a big problem that philosophers of probability have identified what looks like pretty dodgy reasoning, fallacious reasoning in um, the multiverse explanation of fine tuning, that it commits what's called the inverse gambler's fallacy. Interesting thing is, this has been in the academic journals for decades. I think it was 1982 this was first published on. Um, and yet, in a classic case of academics talking to themselves, nobody knows about it, despite huge interest. You know, there's huge interest from religious people using fine tuning to argue for God, or scientists, as you say, arguing for some kind of multiverse. Um, nobody knows about this stuff. So, you know, that's one thing I was excited about with, with my recent book of getting this problem with the multiverse hypothesis out to, out to a broader audience and connecting it with the science as well in the, in the academic, you know, techie journal articles on probability theory. Nobody's actually connected this to the scientific theory of the multiverse. So that's mm. something I've tried to do as well. And it's funny because it's become so popular at the moment, all the movies, everything everywhere all at once and Absolutely. all the other Spider-Verse or something. And all of these movies, everyone's, we're all full. Yeah, I didn't, I haven't seen, I've, I saw the old ones with the the weird actor who goes emo in it. Um, I can't remember. Who was supposed to be the horrible guy, Tobey Maguire. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, yeah, I've been for a few generations of Spider-Man. Toby, yep. Toby Maguire was my one, and I, I found out he was he was maybe not a very nice man. And so oh, really, because um, he's player X in Molly Bloom's poker story. Molly, Molly Bloom, mm. uh, who I interviewed before, made a whole poker thing with all the celebrities, and Toby Maguire is apparently someone called Player X who was just horrific to everyone all the time, and uh, and and with, they think it's him. Um, but that's a sidetrack. But if there's no multiverse, there's not another version of him all over the place. There's yeah. not another Spider-Man. It's become very popular, of course, the multiverse. So what is this? What, what did yeah. you call it? The ga gambler's fallacy. The inverse gambler's fallacy. So it's connected to people might be familiar with the more regular gambler's fallacy. This is when you've been playing in the casino all night and you've had terrible luck. And you think, well, I'll play one more time. As I, I'm due some luck this time. You know, I've, I've, I can't. It, you know, I can't be play bad all night, so I'm, I'm probably going to roll well this time. Now, everyone agrees that's a fallacy because the the odds in any individual, you know, say you're trying to roll double six, the odds of getting a double six are the same in every individual roll, namely one in 36. Doesn't matter if it's your first roll or you've been playing all night or whatever. So that's the regular gambler's fallacy. The inverse gambler's fallacy sort of turns that around. Okay, so here's... It's a big debate here, but there's a there's a vivid analogy to try and set it up. So suppose, Andrew, you and I go to a casino tonight in London and we walk in and the first thing we see is some guy in the first room just having an incredible run of luck. You know, he's just rolling well and well and well and winning thousands of pounds. It's unbelievable. And I turn to you and I say, wow, there must be lots of people in the casino tonight. And you say... Like, what are you talking about? We've just seen this one guy. What's that got to do with people elsewhere in the casino? And I say, well, if there are tens of thousands of people in the casino, it's not so surprising that somebody in the casino is going to roll well. And that's what we've just observed, you know, someone, somebody rolling well. Now, everyone agrees that's also a fallacy. That's the inverse gambler's fallacy because our observational evidence is just pertains to this one individual and no matter how many people there are or aren't in other rooms in the casino, it has no bearing on how likely it is that this one individual, the only one we've observed, is going to play well. But that looks like strikingly similar reasoning to somebody trying to explain fine-tuning in terms of a multiverse, right? We observe our universe. We think, oh my God, against incredible odds, it's got the right numbers for life. There must be loads of other universes with terrible numbers. Um, but again, our observational evidence is just this one universe we've observed. Just like in my example, it was just the one individual. And no matter how many other universes there are out there, it makes it no more likely that this universe, the only one we've observed, is going to be fine-tuned for life. 
So there's a big debate here. I'm sure you might have some objections or concerns, but that's the starting point of what after over a couple of years really dragged me kicking and screaming into <laughs> taking seriously cosmic purpose and writing a book on it. Objection number one. And only because Bring I don't know about, I'm coming at you oh, as, yeah. as a lay person who doesn't know about probability and things like that. It, if one person has earned that much money gambling or on a lottery, someone's just won the lottery, it surely does make it extremely unlikely that that person was the only person to have bought a lottery ticket because that's mad that a one out of one shot at it won the lottery. So doesn't it make it more likely that there were hundreds of thousands of people who tried to win the lottery or no? It depends how you how you know about the evidence, really. So, right, so say you see on TV someone's won the lottery. Well, then we've got a situation where whoever won the lottery, you were going to know about it because that, that person was going to be on TV, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas... Suppose you're someone in isolation and you, you you have no contact with other people and it's just you and you play the lottery every week um, and this week your numbers come up. In that scenario, um, you've got no, you, you can't infer, oh, there must have been lots of people playing. playing. Uh, the, the, so the classic article on this from the year 2000 by Roger White distinguishes the selection effect from a converse selection effect. So the selection effect in fine tuning is if we observe anything, we're going to observe a fine tuned universe, right? Because if the universe wasn't fine tuned, there wouldn't be life, we wouldn't be here, right? So that's the selection effect. The converse selection effect runs it the other way around. That if there's a fine tuned universe, then we're going to observe it. Now, there isn't a converse selection effect, right? It's just because there was a fine-tuned universe. It could have been the next universe that was fine-tuned and maybe we're not in it, but some aliens are or something. Whereas in, in, in the lottery example we just, just discussed, there's not just a selection effect, but there's a converse selection effect because, because of the television and the journalists finding the winner and sticking them on telly, whoever wins the lottery, we're going we're gonna to find out about it, right? But that's not the reality in the fine tuning case, right? Although it's true that if we observe anything, we're going to observe a fine tuned universe, it's not true that if there's a fine tuned universe, we're going to observe it. So that's the important difference to that lottery analogy. Is the only evidence then for the multiverse, is it, is it just like, oh, well, this is so unlikely that all of these numbers have gotten just right to form a universe, so there must be many more? No. So this is important important point to make actually. And again, I think one of the things I'm happy about in this book is connecting up these discussions of the inverse gambler's fallacy objection to the multiverse with actually the, the, the scientific discussion of the multiverse. So there is, some physicists think at least, some kind of tentative evidence for some kind of multiverse. The, the form of the multiverse that's most often discussed is what's called eternal inflation. And roughly the idea is that there's some kind of huge mega universe that's always exponentially expanding. It's just getting bigger and bigger really quick. And then within that, certain regions slow down. They're still expanding, but they slow down in their expansion and become sort of universes in their own right, sometimes called bubble universes. So if you imagine, you know, there's this huge mega universe with these bubbles in it. Um, now we could, we could go, go through s some of the evidence or not for that, but it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with fine tuning, right? The, the tentative evidence for taking this idea seriously. But the problem is though, there, I mean, in, in principle, there are, there are two ways of running such a, a multiverse hypothesis, right? It could be that all of these universes have exactly the same physics, right? All the numbers are exactly the same, and so they're all fine-tuned. I call this 
homogenous eternal inflation, right? They're all, they've all got the same physics. Now, obviously that wouldn't deal with fine tuning because they're all fine tuned. Yeah. You know, we've got maybe more of a problem. What, what are just a, a couple of examples of the, of just very basic yeah, so, fine tuned things? I mean, the example that's perhaps most baffled physicists revolves around dark energy. So this is the force that propels the accelerating expansion of our universe. Um, we learned in 1998 that our universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating in its expansion. Now, once you do the calculations, it becomes clear that if that force had been a little bit stronger, everything would have shot apart so quickly that no two particles would have ever met. So we wouldn't have had stars, planets, any kind of structural complexity. Whereas if that force had been significantly weaker, it wouldn't have counteracted gravity. And so the, the whole universe would have collapsed back on itself within a split second of the Big Bang. Okay. So for life, any kind of structural complexity to be possible, it had to be in a fairly narrow range. So that's, that's one example. So the multiverse hypothesis you need to deal with this, you're going you're gonna to want different universes having different numbers in their physics. So some of them... Mm the force pushing things apart is stronger and some it's weaker. And then statistically, you get some that are just right for life. So I call that heterogeneous uh, eternal inflation or heterogeneous multiverse, where you've got different physics in the different universes. I don't know how you pronounce that word. Is it heterogeneous, heterogeneous? Um, you've got two conflicting versions of the multiverse. Homogeneous multiverse, where the physics is the same in all the universes. Heterogeneous, where you've got different physics in different universes. Now, all the physicists wanting to explain fine tuning go for the latter, right? They say, look, there's different numbers. You know, in some universes, gravity's stronger, in some it's weaker, in some electrons are heavier, some are lighter. And so by chance, in some universes, you get the right numbers for life. Crucially though, that, I mean, there is no empirical evidence that that is the case, that there are, there might be empirical evidence for some kind of multiverse, but there isn't empirical evidence for different physics in different universes. Now, there may be some theoretical reasons to take that possibility seriously. People bring in string theory, for example. But what I've tried to argue is the only way to avoid this inverse gambler's fallacy is to go for the homogeneous version of the multiverse where there's the same physics in all the universes. So, so yeah, I, I don't have a problem with the multiverse and there is some evidence of it independent of fine tuning. I argue that if you're going to go that way, it's just not an option to have diverse physics in the different universes. And so it's just not a way you're going to be able to deal with fine tuning. So unfortunately, we're stuck with this weird cosmic purpose and we just got to get used to it. What does it all mean? <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so... That question could co come two ways, right? What does it mean? What is it telling us about reality? How do we make sense of there being a sort of directedness at the bottom of reality? Another question is, what does it mean for us, for human meaning and purpose? How does it affect the meaning of life? Most of my book is just the cold-blooded scientific philosophical arguments of say arguing this this does point to cosmic purpose and trying to make sense of how reality could be to make sense of cosmic purpose but and they're the questions i suppose i feel a bit more comfortable with but in the first and last chapters i do try to think about how this could Im impact the meaning of our lives what was okay i've got one more i've got another question to ask you but first tell me where people can you know tell me about your book where people can find it where they can find you the book is called Why the Purpose of the Universe. Very modest title, Oxford University Press. Um, and the audio version and all that, narrated by myself. Mm. Uh, Realised there were lots of typos as I read it out. Yeah. Um, my previous book, Galileo's Error, uh, is more on panpsychism and consciousness, although there's elements of that in the new book as well. Um, I spend too long on Twitter arguing Philip underscore Goff. Fill up with one L. So if you want to have an argument on Twitter, have a come along. Um, and website, philipgoffphilosophy.com with lots of sort of videos of interviews and uh, popular and academic articles. So I suppose there's those two aspects of my job, really. The 
every, every time I write an academic article, I try to write a popular version of it to reach out to a broader audience, which philosophers yeah. don't do enough of. Yeah, that's so, what it's about. Yeah, I remember absolutely. Malcolm Gladwell saying like his father never respected him because his father was an academic, you know, mm -hmm. maths books, I think it was, mathematics and stuff. And Malcolm was like, well, you know, do, do you want do you want people to actually read it or not? And um, exactly. a, you can imagine a parent and a son really <laughs> kicking off over those things. <laughs> oh, I should add, I should add, sorry, my YouTube channel. Yes. Mind Chat, which is, uh, I run with a philosopher with the polar opposite opinion to me on consciousness. So I think consciousness is everywhere. He thinks it doesn't exist at all wow. in a certain sense. And we need to be scientists and philosophers. And I call it the podcast with the lowest production values and the greatest philosophy. So we just oh. haven't got time to make these wonderful videos. You make Andrew just get a, get a scientist, hit broadcast, stick it on YouTube. But, um, we have some good chats. So yeah. yeah. Mind chat, not mind chat. Cause that sounds so mind, German. Mind, <laughs> mind chat. You must see mind chat. If you do, yeah. Bye -bye. I think I'd like to get on TikTok, but I'll, I'll probably never get around to it. It's a waste of time. Yeah. You oh, think yes, you don't man. recommend no revenue, um, and no rhyme or reason as to where your videos are going and what will do well. And yeah, you just yeah. drive yourself up. It's like the universe. One might say, Philip is a difficult, it's one of the worst names to spell actually. I'm angry at you about that. It is an annoying. You've always got to say mm. one L, two Ls. I always, have, I always have to spell both my names because a lot of people spell Goff, G-O-U-G-H. Oh, for so, God's sake. So I do get I'm gold sorry. that way. I am Pe sorry. People think it's G-O-U-L-D for gold as well um, uh, a lot of the time. But gold. Philip, because yeah, there's always like a Prince Philip or something. I've got Because the problem is you can't see the I's from the L's necessarily. So you're really trying to zoom in on mm. where the I, is that an I or an L? And you I can't, thought about this. Oh, you're getting me down. Though. That's the problem with Philip. <laughs> but look, it's your name. It's hard to spell, I'm stuck with it, but that makes it better, doesn't it? You know, you need you need things to be complicated. Um, who's a heretic you admire? Oh yeah, I'm gonna say the philosopher Thomas Nagel, hmm. who, for most of his career, was very much not a heretic, as a very established, very important, influential philosopher of consciousness and many other areas. Um, but in 2012, he wrote a book called mind and cosmos subtitle something like why the materialist neo-darwinian paradigm is almost certainly false and i mean it was very similar to the the book i'm myself writing now there's some differences he was raising problems for how our standard materialist darwinian uh mode of explanation deals with consciousness and uh, moral awareness and reason and um, and he ultimately pointed to something like what I'm calling cosmic purpose. As a, I mean, he said, I don't know what the hell the, the alternative is, but took take seriously some kind of teleology or or directedness. Now, you know, if he'd have been arguing for God, there probably would have been some polite reviews from theologians, and everyone else would have ignored it. But he said, you know, he didn't like the he didn't believe in God either. And for daring to not fit into acceptable categories, um, he was absolutely hammered in reviews. You know, people said, oh, he's lost the plot. This is, you know, the great fall of a once great thinker. He was absolutely, really unfairly hammered. Um, you know, and what is interesting, 11, year, 11 years later, my book has not had that kind of reception. You know, it's been well-reviewed in major newspapers all around the world, got a five-star review in Popular Science magazine. <laughs> you know, and mm. I don't think that's because I'm a better philosopher. I'm certainly not. I'm a worse philosopher than Thomas Nagel. But I just think that's a sign of how there's a greater openness to these ideas. You know, that's real cultural change wow. we're observing as it is as it is happening. So, so, yeah, I think he's a very, very admirable figure for someone who just wants the truth and is is going to say it even if it makes him look silly and so you know i think he's an important inspiration for me a fascinating um heretic i will put links to philip goff's beautiful works and youtube channel as well below so do go and check out you know help our lovely guest if you want to see more 
intellectual content like that, because maybe you're going, oh, everything else is just all culture wars and things. And the only way to do that is for you to subscribe while watching this video, watch it through, like it, share it, you know, all the stuff. And then I can do more stuff with fascinating people like Philip. And also, I'm going to ask him a couple of questions now for members only on andrewgold.locals.com. That's a lot of information all at once. So remember all of the stuff and keep watching this channel.